Here are our objectives for section 3.2. So number one, identify polynomial functions. Number two, recognize characteristics of graphs of polynomial functions. Number three, determine end behavior. Number four, use factoring to find zeros of polynomial functions. Number five, identify zeros and their multiplicities. Number six, use the intermediate value theorem. Number seven, understand the relationship between degree and turning points. And number eight, graph polynomial functions. Okay? Now, what I want you to realize before I start with any examples or anything like that is that there are some new things in this section. Okay? There are some things in this section that we definitely did in Algebra 2 last year, and there's some things that we did not. So, you, things that I'm showing you today may not seem familiar, and that's because they're not. Okay? I don't want you to think you forgot them, because I know sometimes you forget stuff until I, tar until I start talking about them, and then I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. There's some stuff that's definitely new in this section. Okay? So, let's start off with identifying polynomial functions. Okay? Well, if we're identifying polynomial functions, let me give you the general form of a polynomial first of all. Now that seems like a mess, doesn't it? So let me make sure you understand what it means before we even go on. Is that okay? Okay. So a to the n, sorry, a sub n, x to the n. So whatever term, if this was a 7, this would be a sub 7. So like the seventh term. Yeah? a sub 7 minus 1 would be 6, so this would all be 6, right? So whatever the highest exponent is, this is one less than it. And one less and one less and one, one less until we get to 2 and 1 and no x term. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is the general form of a, of a polynomial, all right? So let me give you some examples. Example number 1 f of x equals negative 3x to the fifth plus two, so square root of 2x squared plus 5. Okay, uh, can I go back up to the polynomial real quick? Okay, I need to make sure you understand that whatever the highest exponent is, whatever that first term, as long as the, the exponents are in order from greatest to least, this highest exponent is called a degree. Okay, that's called the degree. So first, on this first example, what I want to ask you is, is this a polynomial? Well, we kind of have to have an idea of what a polynomial is, right? So these terms are all numbers, and these terms are all decreasing numbers, starting at, I don't know, 9, 7, 3, something like that, until you get to 0, right? So what can they not be? Yeah, they can't be negative, can they? Okay, so that that's a, a, a sign right there that will tell you that it's that something's weird if you have a negative exponent. Okay, it'll tell you it's not a polynomial. And I'll show you some more examples of what makes not a polynomial. Is that okay? But this right here starts at 5 and then 2 and then 1. Even there's not a 4 and a 3, can that still be a polynomial? Yes, and in fact, this one is. Yes, this is a polynomial. Would you please tell me what the degree is? Mm-hmm. The degree is 5. And why is it 5? It's the highest exponent, right? Even if it's not in order, is the degree still the highest exponent? Yes. Okay? Typically, we like to keep them in order because that makes everything nice and pretty. Okay? All right, here's a second example negative 4 x to the 1 half plus 2 x squared minus 5. Is that a polynomial? They're not in order, but even more obvious is a fraction. Can we have a fraction 
as an exponent, if we're finding out if this is a polynomial or not, no, we cannot. So this is not a polynomial. And if it's not a polynomial, then we don't even care what its degree is. Because if it's not a polynomial, there's not really a degree, right? Okay. There's still a highest exponent, but part of the part of the deal is we're looking for polynomials. And if it's a polynomial, what's its degree? Is that fair? Okay. So what about this one? f of x equals 3x to the 6th plus 3x to the 5th plus 18x to the 4th. What do you think about that? Is that a polynomial or not? Yes. Even though there's not an x squared and an x and a constant? Yeah, there's. it's still allowed to be a polynomial, isn't it? There's no fractional exponents. There's no negative exponents, right? So what's its degree then? Good. Six. One more example. f of x equals 5x to the negative 2 plus 4x squared minus 18. Yes or no? Why? Because of the negative 2. That is not a polynomial. And because it's not a polynomial, we don't care what the highest exponent is, right? Okay. Our next objective, oh, so are you comfortable identifying polynomial functions? Okay. Our next, next objective says recognize characteristics of graphs of polynomial functions. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you four examples and you're going to tell me either yes, it's a polynomial function just by looking at the graph or no. Okay. So right if I go ahead and draw all four of them right at the beginning, we can talk about them from there. There's our first example. I have to fix one, this one because I messed up on it. Can you, can you fix it for me on your notes? Like that. Not this part over here. Can I just redraw it? Jeez Louise. Sorry about that. In a second, you're going to understand why that one's wrong and this one's okay, I think. I hope. I'm not judging your drawing. You didn't judge mine, so I'm not going to judge yours. I'm not going to answer that question yet because you're going to answer it for yourself in just a second. Once we figure out what the characteristics are that we're looking at that we need to have, then you'll be able to tell or not. Is that okay? Okay. So our, what we're trying to do is decide are these four graphs polynomial functions or not? And if they are, why? And if they're not, why? Okay. So I'm going to tell you this first one. What do you think? Is it a polynomial function or not? Yes. In fact, it looks like a function we've studied before, doesn't it? Okay. So I'll give you a start. This is a polynomial function because it's smooth and it's continuous. You remember what continuous means? It means there's no breaks. And smooth means it's rounded here and here, right? Okay, 
So can you tell me about the second one? Is that a polynomial or not? Why? So it's discontinuous because it's right here. Stops and starts again. Okay. What about this crazy one? Because it's smooth and continuous, right? So why was I not happy with the first one I drew? If it's right here and it comes back over here, is it a function anymore? It's not a function anymore, is it? Vertical line test says you can't have only have one place touching, right? So that's why I was unhappy with that one. I'm still worried about right here, but hopefully you get the idea, yes? Okay. What about this last one? No why? Not smooth. This comes to a point. That's not smooth, is it? Okay. So now you look at the ones you drew and ask me that same question as before. You see what I'm saying? So it may not go down as far as mine, but is it smooth and continuous? Then it is a polynomial function. It may not go up as high as mine, but if it breaks, even though there's still a value here and not here, that is, that is discontinuous. So that's not a function. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Then let's look at our next objective. Our next objective talks about end behavior. Now this is definitely something we talked about in Algebra 2, so we're just going to review this part. You're okay with that? I mean, I could just skip over it if you want. No. Oh, no, no. You don't want me to skip over it? Okay. So let's talk about two specific polynomials that you guys are really good at. Okay, you're really good at these two specific polynomials. This one, what is the parent function of this one? x squared, right? Now it's not x squared. It's not y equals x squared. That's not the equation because I didn't put it going through the origin, right? But you know that this is a quadratic, so x squared is the parent function, y equals, okay? Again, I'm not saying that that's the equation of this because it doesn't go through the origin like it should, but that's the parent function, right? What's the parent function of this one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay? <clears throat> Notice for me, please, what is happening on the left side of this parabola? It's going up. So what we normally say is on the left, it's rising. What's happening on the right? Rising. I mean, what's happening in the middle? Do we care? We don't care, right? Well, because what are we talking about? Just the end behavior. What's happening at the very ends? We don't care about what's happening in the middle. It could go if it wanted to, right? We only care about the end. Okay? What's happening on the left behavior on this one? So it's falling, right? It falls. What about the right behavior? I'm sorry I put rising over here and rises over here. Are you going to be okay with that? I could have put rises and rises or falling and rises, whatever. I mix up my gerunds and my plurals. So here's what I need you to understand, okay? <clears throat> what kind of a number is this two compared to this one? This is an even number, isn't it? A 2 is an even number, right? A 3 is an odd number, right? Well, the characteristics of all even polynomials are going to be the same as this. 
the characteristics of all odd polynomials are the same as this. No matter if there's a 5 in front or a plus x and a minus 7 or anything like that. The characteristics of even polynomials are going to look like this and odd polynomials are going to look like this. Okay, I'm going to write some definitions down really quick just to make sure that we have them um, clear in our head. Okay, what is a degree? Mm-hmm. Whoops, how about if I spell it correctly? Highest exponent. And earlier in this equation, what was it actually called? It's actually called n, isn't it? So we're going to make sure we have that written down here. I want to be able to use a little abbreviation that's not really technically mathy, really. But I want to be able to say LC. Any idea what I mean by LC? Mm -hmm. The leading coefficient. You okay with that? <clears throat> so remembering back to this equation, can I just write this equation for us again so I don't have to keep moving this paper back and forth? Are you okay with that? Okay. f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a to the n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus a, two, a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. Okay, you have that okay? So here's what I need you to know. These are the characteristics if n is even. So just like this graph up here, okay? First of all, I want you to know that the end behaviors are the same. Isn't that true on this one? In this case, they're both rising, right? What if one of them was falling? Then the other one would be falling, wouldn't it? Like if this got reflected across an axis or something? the x-axis. So the end behaviors are going to be the same. Okay. Now you can tell exactly what the end behaviors are going to be just by looking at the equation. You don't even have to look at the graph. You don't have to like type the equation and look at the graph to tell because you can just look at the leading coefficient. If the leading coefficient is positive then it will rise right And because we know they're the same, it will also rise left. If the leading coefficient is negative, you know it will fall right. And because you know they're the same, you know it will also fall left. Okay? What happens though if n is odd? So it's going to look like this. Tell me about the n behaviors right now. In general, like this one. In fact, they're going to be opposite, right? If one goes up, the other goes down. Okay? So the n behaviors. are opposite. N is odd. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I wrote it and printed here in cursive here. I didn't mean to confuse you. So the leading coefficient being positive or negative hopefully is telling you which way things are opening up or down. Or, or rising left or rising right, right? Okay, here's the deal. I probably, when I wrote this side, should have written these backwards. Because the leading coefficient tells us our left behavior. Okay, leading coefficient tells us our left behavior. Is that what I want to say? No, it's not what I want to say at all. Our leading coefficient tells us our right behavior, so 
Oh my gosh, I was actually right in the beginning. Sorry. Our leading coefficient tells us our right behavior. So if I'm looking right here and I know my leading coefficient is positive, what's happening to the right? It rises. Rises, right. So what's happening to the left behavior if we know they are opposite? Falls, left. So if the leading coefficient is negative, what happens on the right? Falls right. I know because it's an odd lead, uh, degree that the end behaviors are opposite, so what happens to the left? Oh no. Ugh. Thank you. I said it correctly, and then I wrote it wrong. Maybe I do need a nap. <laughs> yeah. All right, any questions on end behavior? You feeling comfortable with end behavior? Use factoring to find zeros of polynomial functions. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to do a lot of examples of factoring. Why? We already did a whole bunch of factoring examples last chapter, didn't we? Okay, so I'm confident that you're feeling that, that you know how to find the factors. Uh, I know you, I'm confident that you know how to factor. I'm just going to give you an example to get it back into your head. Is that fair? Okay. Yes, maybe. Okay, that's fair. So here's your example. Six x squared minus thirteen x minus five. Okay, we're trying to factor. We're using factoring to find the zeros of the polynomial function. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you right now. You're going to have to figure out what kind of answers the computer wants based on how it asks the question. And I'll show you what I mean by that when we when we actually get to the answer of this. Is that okay? Okay. So remembering how we factor this, there's lots of different ways. The most common way that we used was the AC method. And we said AC, which was A, B, and C is 6 times negative 5, right? So negative 30. And then what's B? Negative 13. So what two numbers multiply to be negative 30 and add to be negative 13? So 10 and 3 are the first numbers to jump to mind, right? So if it's going to be negative 30, they have to be opposite signs. So either a negative 10 and a positive 3, or a positive 10 and negative 3, right? Which combination of those two numbers will give me negative 13? Uh-huh. Because negative 10 and positive 3 is negative 7. And 10 and negative 3 is 7. So maybe we chose the wrong numbers to begin with? But it was logical, right? 10 and 3. Oh, 10 and 3 is 13. Except when you look at the signs, you've got to be careful, okay? So what about if we try 15 and 2? You okay with that? So what kind of 15 and what kind of 2, though? Negative 15 and positive 2? Because that will give me a negative 13 if I add them together, right? So remember, what we do is I rewrite this equation by splitting my middle term into two parts the two numbers that you just told me. So negative 15x and positive 2x. Are you remembering this now? Okay. So now there's four terms and when there's four terms I always first try to factor by grouping. So I group the first two terms and I group the last two terms. Okay. If I just look at these first two terms right here, what is the greatest common factor of those two terms? They're both divisible by 3x, right? 
So if I factor out a 3x just from the first two terms, what's left over? Perfect, 2x minus 5, okay? Now I know because of rules of grouping, I need another parentheses over here of 2x minus 5, but I always have to factor out something. So what should I factor out? What's the greatest common factor of 2x minus 5? 1, yeah, absolutely. So if I factor out a 1, I'm left with 2x minus 5. Now remember, at first that seems kind of confusing until we realize what the next step is, okay? The next step is I look at this term and I look at this term and I say, what do they have in common? What is its greatest common factor? 2x minus 5, right? So if I factor out a 2x minus 5 from each one of those terms, what's left? 3x plus 1, right? And if I wouldn't have factored out that 1, that would have been super confusing, right? So I need that 3x plus 1 for my second um, parentheses there, okay? So here was what I was talking about a minute ago, okay? These two things right here are called the factors. But notice what our objective is. Use factoring to find the zeros of the polynomial functions. Remember from the very beginning, this equation is equal to zero, right? And if I have two numbers that multiply together to give me an answer of zero, what has to be true of at least one of these? It has to equal zero, doesn't it? The only, that's the only way you can multiply two numbers together and get a zero is if one of them is a zero, right? Well, I don't know which one it is, do you? So we're not going to chance it, and we're going to set both of them equal to zero. Because in fact, they both are able to make that sentence a true sentence. Whatever I get for this, if I plug it in, it'll give me zero. Whatever I uh, get for this, if I plug it in, it'll get me zero. So I have to take both of them into account, okay? So these are my two factors, so I'm going to set them equal to zero and solve them. So here I'm going to add 5 to both sides to get 2x equals 5 and divide both sides by 2, which gives me x equals 5 over 2. Here I'm going to add 1 to both sides to give me 3x equals 1. Divide both sides by 3 to give me x equals 1 third. These right here are called the zeros. So when you're trying to answer these questions, what I want you to be careful of is, is it asking you for the factors, which are these, or is it asking you for the zeros, which is these? Does that make sense? Okay. If it gives you a set of parentheses to fill in, it's obviously asking for the factors. But if it says x equals, definitely asking for the zeros. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Next objective is identifying zeros and their multiplicities. Have you ever heard of that word before? Mm -mm, probably not, right? Do you think you could figure out what it was, what it meant? What does that word kind of mean? Maybe multiply. What about multiple? That means more, more than one of something, right? There's multiple. I would like to have multiple chocolate cakes. I think that would be fun. Or what? Oh yeah, cherry pie or chocolate pie. Mm -hmm. What about a chocolate cherry pie? Oh my gosh. Jeez oh, Louise. Let's look at this example right here. Okay. This example says x plus 1 times x plus 1 times x plus 5 equals 0. It's already factored for us, right? Well, if I set each of these factors equal to 0, I'm going to get x equals negative 1, x equals negative 1, and x equals negative 5, right? Okay. Well, what are my actual solutions then? Isn't it just negative 1 and negative 5? Well, that means that negative 1 has a multiplicity of 2. Why? Because there's two of them. Yeah, it's exactly right. OK? 
Okay? Does 5 have a multiplicity? There's only one of them. But negative 1 has a multiplicity of 2 because there's two of them. Okay? Okay. This example. We're going to throw this in a different light, right? I'm writing as a function now, not an equation, right? Okay? So x plus 4 squared times x minus 5 to the third. So what are my solutions? Negative 4 and 5. Does negative 4 have a multiplicity? Yeah, so that's of 2, right? Does 5 have a multiplicity of 3? Okay, now here's the deal. If you look at the graph, just the graph, you can tell something about that. And I will tell you that tomorrow.